Welcome everyone, this is Bob Wurzelbacher. I am the director of the Respect Life Office for the Archdiocese of Cincinnati, and this is our podcast video series that we call Being Pro-Life. Each month, we'll discuss a different topic in the Respect Life arena, and we'll hear the personal story of someone who was deeply affected by that issue, and then we'll let you know how you can get involved. This month's topic is undocumented immigrants. As always, we have a special guest with us today. Would you please introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Jose Arnulfo Cabrera. I am the Immigration Program Organizer at the Intercommunity Justice and Peace Center, and I'm a recent graduate from Xavier University. Welcome, Jose. Now, Jose was brought here by his parents when he was only four years old. So, Jose, mm-hmm. take us back and tell us that story of how you came here to the United States. So, I was born dirt poor on a dirt floor. I lived in a small shack with aluminum walls and aluminum roof. No running water, no electricity, a bed in a bucket. So when I was four years old, my parents decided to come to the United States. My father told my mom that not only would I get an education in the United States, but I would also get better health care and I would have more opportunities that I could never obtain in Mexico. Because I was so young at the time and my parents were so poor that they couldn't afford a visa to enter the United States, they had to cross the border without inspection. And the coyote, a man that brings people across the border, told my parents that he had a son who was about my age and that if he had paid them a little bit more money that he could get me across through the Mexican-U.S. border in Nogales and he would say that I was his son and I would go like any other U.S. citizen who was in Mexico going back to, to the United States would go. While my parents had to cross the border, they thought that it would take them two days to cross but it ended up taking four days and three nights. And in that time period, I was in a hotel room with a complete stranger that I had never met and also a complete stranger that my parents didn't fully know and know what he could have done. But for them, it was the only way for them to get into this country so I can get an education. I mean, I can barely imagine the worry and heartbreak it would take for parents of a four-year-old child to put the child in the hands of a complete stranger to take over the border of a country in order to cross over in a different way. The desperation that they must have felt in order to feel this is the only possible way to have some kind of a life for this family. I mean, like I said, we were very poor and there was literally no opportunities for me in Mexico. Every parent wants their child to live a better life. And coming over as a documented immigrant was not in the realm of possibility for your parents. No, because in order for you to get a simple visitor visa to the United States from Mexico, you have to have a certain amount of money in the bank. You have to own property or own land. You have to have something that will ensure the United States that you are going to come back to Mexico and not overstay your visa. And my family, who was dirt poor, they didn't have that. So they had to do it in a different way. So can you tell me a little bit more about the journey your parents took, what they might have told you about how dangerous it was? So it actually took them four days and three nights just to get across. My mom would talk about how while they were crossing, they were actually picked up by the coyotes. And my mom said that when they heard the siren of the Border Patrol, she jumped out of the truck and pulled my father along. And then the other guys who were following them jumped out along with them and they ran off and hid under cactuses because they knew that the border agents wouldn't chase them in the field of the cactus. So they would sleep there and stay there for days trying to hide. Uh, She mentioned one day they were resting under a tree and when she opened her eyes, there was a rattlesnake right in front of her. And you know, it's four days and three nights, no food, no water crossing the desert that is known for its many deaths that most of the time war agents spent their time collecting bodies rather than trying to stop migrants from crossing. And all this time, of course, your parents know that they have a four-year-old son. And this is actually one of my favorite parts when my mom shares the story. She talks about an incident when my father wanted to quit and wanted to go back and said that it was too hard. And he said, you know, we'll pay for the boy to come back and we'll try our luck some other time. And so my mother, she said, you know what? You guys can go back. But my son's in the other side of that wall and I'm going to cross whether you follow me or not. And she was very stubborn and she said she'd continue walking until the guys decided, what the heck? We'll just follow her. And it 
you know, it was just a moment where she showed she wasn't going to let anything stop her from right. getting into her son. Right. It's hard for me to imagine, but I suppose if a parent is in a situation of knowing how difficult and arduous the journey will be with no food, no water, rattlesnakes <laughs> running, running around yeah. in the desert, yeah. people that you have to worry about actually uh, harming you as well, and having to choose between taking your child through that and hope for the best versus bringing your child safely into the country and hoping to reunite with them later is considered a better option. You just have to be really desperate, I guess, to be willing to take a journey like that. So they make their way to the United States. They are reunited with you in the hotel room in, in Arizona. Right. Okay, so then what happens from there with your family? My father, he was offered a job working at Paul Brown Stadium. And so we kind of settled here and we've been here ever since. That quickly turned to me starting kindergarten. So my parents took me to the children's hospital and the more tests I had to take, the more problems I had and the more therapists I needed to address the many learning disabilities that I had. And that inadvertently led my father to develop a drinking habit and a drug habit to where he would beat me and my mom in a regular basis. And this continued on until I was eight years old when he finally left the house and left me, my mom, and my two younger sisters, Esther and Karina. From the moment we came to this country to the moment my father left, my mother had never left the kitchen. My mother was raised that her duty in life was to be a good housewife. She couldn't read or write in English. She couldn't drive and she didn't know where to pay bills. She didn't know how to pay them and she wasn't able to get a job. And so we were evicted from our home and we became homeless for some time. So your mother is now living in the United States. She's an undocumented immigrant. She has an eight-year-old son. She has two young daughters who are U.S. citizens, but she has no job skills because she was raised to be a homemaker. Even if she did have outside skills, she, as an undocumented immigrant, doesn't have much opportunity to find a job to use them. And now she's a single mom trying to raise three children. So what did your mother do then at that point? My mom was able to get a job cleaning houses and then another job busting tables at a restaurant. And we would see her for maybe two to three hours a day. She would wake up early. She would get us ready for the school bus, drop us off, and then go to her first job. Then she would come home around the same time we were coming home from school. She fed us, she ate, and then she went to her second job and was coming home around one or two in the morning. And who was taking care of you when she was at work and you were not in school? It ended up landing on me because babysitter is very expensive. So I was the eight-year-old taking care of my little sisters. Wow. Your mother sounds like an incredible, strong, brave, determined woman. She really does. She is. She is. So this is your life. So now you're growing up, you're in high school, and now you start thinking about your future. You're realizing what your status, I guess, if you will. I started off my freshman year of high school unable to read or write and unable to do basic math. So teachers were kind of writing me off, but I was in the Big Brother and Big Sisters program. Okay. And my big brother, David, we were always in a coffee shop or a library or his house, just doing the very basics and trying to catch up to my peers until I was able to make first honors all four semesters and graduate with a 3.6 GPA. And then was accepted to Xavier and received so many academic scholarships because I worked really hard and, and tried to, to improve my education that I pretty much was on a full ride at Xavier. Wow. So you enter your freshman year of high school, unable to read or write or do basic math. And by your senior year, you are an honors student. So it sounds like David was a very powerful influence in your life as well. And to this day, he is. Right. So good job to big brothers and big sisters. I owe them a lot. <laughs> Okay, so now, so you went from a very challenging start to high school to working very hard and doing well by your senior year. You have scholarships locally to Xavier University here. Tell me a little bit about how you're still undocumented, right? Or now you can do that only because of certain laws that were in place by then. Yeah, so I have DACA, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrival. It was an executive order by President Obama in 2012 that it would grant a work visa for undocumented youth who were brought to the United States before they were 16 
who entered the United States before June 15 of 2007 and have been present for consecutive years, don't have a felony or more than two misdemeanors, and are in school going into higher education or into a two-year uh, grade school. So as long as you fit that criteria, you qualify for de deferred action for childhood arrivals. If you got it, you were protected from deportation. Once you fill out all of the paperwork, and they are long, there are three different forms that you can fill out, giving very detailed information about you. You send it out with a $500 money order to the U.S. government, and then they review it, put in your name in all different forms of databases, and they do a very extensive background check along with your fingerprints. And once you pass all of those different background checks, then you are given a work visa with a social security card that says, not valid for re-entering the United States. And you have that for two years. After those two years, you can renew it, sending all of those forms and going through all that process again, along with another $500 check, you can keep having a work permit till whenever. And you also have to be between the ages 16 to 31. Okay. Even people who do not empathize with being brought here to the United States as a child, where you didn't even have any control of that, it still might believe that, oh, they're just handing out these work visas to anybody who wants to walk up to the desk and say, oh, I was brought here. But yeah. there are many things that you have to provide that not everybody is, not most perhaps even, are going to be able to qualify for, in addition to the $500, which is going to be hard right. to come up with if you can't get a job under normal circumstances. Right. So DACA gave you both the ability to work while you're in school to help pay for your education, help help your family out, those sorts of things, as well as give you the opportunity to work in the field that you're studying for. So what are you studying, Jose? Graduate with a degree in entrepreneurship with a minor in justice and peace studies. Okay. What are your plans with that right now? So I'm actually going to be moving to D.C. I have a year-long internship as the government relations associate. Now, is any of that going to be affected by what's happening with the expiration of DACA? It would all be, um, because depending on where that stands, either I will lose my DACA and won't be allowed to renew. And if it does not get renewed, then your plans going to D.C. and the work you're doing there, that all goes away. Essentially, it will go away. And you can't get a work visa as an undocumented immigrant, no. except through the DACA program. Now, what if someone were to say to you, Jose, just do what you need to do to become a citizen instead of expecting the government to hand you citizenship? What's your response to that? Are you willing to marry me? <laughs> okay, and that would be one way. Citizen? Okay. Was that no? Are you willing what else? Yeah. What's your other option? Are you willing to beat me up so I can file a police report and hopefully be eligible to obtain a U visa? What is that? A U visa is a visa for someone who is a victim of a crime. And it has to be a, a really bad crime. If you got mugged, it doesn't guarantee you a U visa. If you got mugged and were left for dead, then possibly. So are those the only two options? Are there other options? There's also the T visa. If I was a victim of human trafficking, that I thankfully I am not. There is the people who suffer from domestic violence, but the your abuser has to be a U.S. citizen. Other than that, there is no option, and that's what this whole movement is about. Because there is no way for me to quote wait in line. There's no line for you to wait in in the first place. So if DACA expires and nothing happens with it. You would be someone who was brought here as a child to the United States, who's worked very hard trying to do something with your life, going to school, contribute mm -hmm. to society, and you wouldn't be able to because you would have to go into the life that your mother had, that your father had, of just taking whatever kind of unskilled labor someone would be willing to give to you and pay you onto the table with. That would become your life. Is that right? Yes. To someone who would say, well, you should just go back to your home country. You were four years old. What, nonetheless, what would you say to them about that? You're not from here. I am from here. I don't know anything about my own country. I can't tell you the Pledge of Allegiance from Mexico, I, but I know America's by heart. Actually, if my name is in it, you know, Jose, can you sing? <laughs> <laughs> 
So, I mean, I, I grew up my whole life here. I've learned that the American way is you roll up your sleeves and you fight the long fight to get what you deserve. So if somebody hears this story and they want to get involved and they want to help, what can we do? So if you're from Cincinnati and you live in Cincinnati, IGPC is the best resource because we have different programs that we can go into churches, into any community or base, and we educate them on our current immigration system and why people can't, quote, get in line and what this whole movement is really about. So that's the biggest one. Let's stop for a second. So IJPC, that's Intercommunity Justice and Peace Center. So you can go to this website at ijpccincinnati.org. So I go to programs, I go to immigration. Yeah, and you scroll down and you can read about our work, the YES program, which is the program I led. It's a group for high school and college age students who want to work to educate and inform others about our outdated immigration system. We also have someone come into your community. If you scroll all the way down the website, right there where he says, invite yes leaders to speak at your group, please fill the form out here. You can fill out the form and request to have a yes member come and share their story and talk about our outdated immigration system and what could you do at that moment to better the situation for undocumented immigrants living in the U.S. So that's a good start. What else can we do? Definitely call your representatives and legislators, send them letters, and do research on what they are doing and what is their stance on immigration. And our website, you can also sign up for our emailing list so you can get email alerts about what is currently happening, things that are moving very rapidly. And, and that's the thing about immigration. Sometimes movement is very slow, but all of a sudden it gets really fast and everything is changing in hours. So sign up for our email list and you can get news up alerts to like call your representative, call your legislator right now. Or it could be there's these current bills that are happening and we're trying to get these people to co-sign it or whatever. So besides going to the IJBC website and contacting your legislators about things that are happening currently, what's another thing that we can do to help out? Please go out and do research about what is currently happening and how our immigration system is outdated. The research and all the information is out there online. And also I encourage everyone to, to make sure that their research is unbiased and factual because it feels like right now in our time, whether something is a fact or an opinion is kind of blurry. And the more informed you are, the best you can do to help the movement. Jose, thank you so much for spending time with us today. Do you have anything else that you want to say to people to change misunderstandings that people might have of undocumented immigrants? The situation about the unaccompanied minors at the border right now. These people are escaping, in a sense, countries that are war-torn. Countries that have a higher homicide rate than many countries in the Middle East and anywhere else in the world. These kids and families, they want a better life. They're not here to take anyone's jobs. They're not even here to obtain DACA. They're just here trying to live a better life. Please do the research and understand the situation that they're coming from. They're coming from neighborhoods whose violent crime rates are higher than other areas of the world that are actually war-torn. The majority of the Central American countries are in the top five of the highest homicide rates in the whole world including violent war places like Syria, for example. Afghanistan, Iraq. That's almost impossible to believe. Yet this is what people are escaping from. I hope that your story touches people and that people get a better understanding of some of the reasons why some people might be here undocumented in the United States for the reasons of escaping violence, escaping dire economic situations, inability to take care of a child that has certain medical or developmental issues or questions like that that they won't be able to do in their home country, being uninformed about what would happen Like you go across documented and not realizing what's going to happen when your visa expires. And hopefully we can inspire people to get involved and educate themselves about what the real plight is of so many undocumented immigrants. And maybe we can change the laws and create pathways. We're not trying to skip the pathway. We're trying to create one that doesn't currently exist. Okay. Well, thank you, Jose, for your time. It was great meeting you and speaking with you. And I hope that... I hope that we can sit down face-to-face before you go to Washington, D.C. Yeah, yeah, anytime. Send me an email, for sure. Let's, Let's get coffee. I would love that.
Yes, maybe we can make that happen. Okay, great. Thank you, Jose. We'll talk to you later. Take care.